And uh, I did a little video editing before we started here and uh, put together. So just, you know, all right. So we had the debates. Uh, I, we talked last week with uh, Rob Cortell about them. My opinion was, uh, we'll start there briefly. My opinion was that Donald Trump lost that debate. Biden did not win it. Biden did not look particularly good. And Donald Trump spent $100 million calling Biden a dotard, basically, which is just a non-functional old person. And then Biden kind of showed up that way, and then Donald Trump just never got out of his way to let that shine through, said crazy stuff. Like, the easiest thing in American politics should be white supremacy is bad. I, de I denounce it in all forms. That didn't happen. And then if you did, if you blow that, then the next day or that night, you release a statement through your people going, you know, I, I had a problem with my ear thing, and I, I just, uh, you know, I, I misunderstood the question. You know, I'm so sorry. I think all these things are bad. But then, you know, even now, he's on Hannity last night. Whew. And he's asked again, you know, Hannity, the thing about the, the clips that I'll play in a moment, the thing about the Bartiromo interview, the Hannity interview, the Rush interview, all of these things, they're like giving him the biggest softballs ever. You know, Hannity tees it up like, you don't like David Duke, right? Well, Antifa is terrible. You're just like, oh, dude. He, I, I have maintained forever that this guy does not want to win. He's actively trying to lose. He never wanted to win the first time. It was a well, we talked about it on the program. And so if we knew it, then it probably was true because everybody around Trump in 2016 was saying it. There uh, is a report out from the New York Times that kind of looks at the finances of the 2016 campaign. And they match what's happening now in the 2020 campaign in that they're not putting it into persuasive ads. They're putting it into building lists and fundraising lists because Donald Trump reportedly wanted to start a TV station when he lost in 2016. And he kept trying to get out of this. He, he, was, he kept saying, like, uh, he never thought he'd win, right? So the tax returns kind of confirmed this, what, what everybody was around him was saying, in, the, in that, listen, the, uh, the, the, the apprentice was coming to an end. He had bought a bunch of investments in, like, 15 golf courses. He had to kind of juice up business. Running in the primary was, you know, with one of the 16 was a way to do that and get his name out there, you know, maybe build, a, get a little list building so you can flip those emails, start a TV network with Roger Ailes, who at that point had, you know, exited Fox News for many reasons. And so, but then he just kept doing well <laughs> and he kept winning the primaries and he couldn't get out of it at a certain point. And like... <laughs> And, and and Pence didn't think he win. Like it, it, it's well documented that on election night, Mike Pence, his wife looked at him and goes, "Are you happy now?" And like stormed out and didn't talk to him for a week. Uh, the, she was so mad they won. Milani was mad. None of these people thought that he was going to get elected, including him. And then he had to be president because listen, Donald Trump's general demeanor is better as a grievance outsider, right? Like it's you, you can. It's hard to, like, fight the swamp when you are the swamp. You're using the White House travel office, for instance, for guaranteed room nights at your properties. Like, that's very swampy. Like, Donald Trump is is charging. He got in trouble for charging the Secret Service, like, $1,000 room nights. He stays at, th there's a book called uh, The Grifters Club about Mar-a-Lago and what's happened at Mar-a-Lago over the last, like, five, six years. And, and like the day he won the election, a membership at Mar-a-Lago went from a hundred thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. He he uh, he stays there like two hundred nights a year because he can then charge the Secret Service for those room nights. And he had to cut it down to like a bare bones price, but it's still tremendously expensive. You know, Mike Pence goes to Scotland uh, or Ireland. I I think it was uh, Scotland to to some summit. And instead of staying close to where the summit was, he stayed 180 miles away at a Trump hotel. And so you, you start to get the picture through all the reporting and, and through everything that Donald Trump really needs to win because it's four more years of immunity. <laughs> and and he's, you see the investigations that are taking place uh, around some of his tax stuff. You know, Bannon gets arrested on that boat. You know, the, the great 
a China is evil guy gets arrested on a Chinese billionaire's boat. And then Eric Trump is testifying three, uh, three days ago. The New York attorney general is starting to close in on all this stuff. Cyrus Vance is really putting some heat on Trump, on his, on him personally, his campaigns, his businesses. And, you know, you look at things like the Trump University stuff, the, the Trump Foundation, like there's no doubt. I mean, even your most ardent Trump supporter, I think, would look at it and go, yeah, he definitely works within the gray area of the rules, if not breaks all the rules and does some illegal shady stuff. And if you operate that way, eventually you get caught. You you they get you. You know, it's sort of like Al Capone on tax evasion. Like you, you can only be too careful before somebody in your organization makes a mistake. And, and there's, that, that, there's a couple different uh, fundraising people that were just indicted the last week. Yeah. Right? And, so, I mean, yeah. they're, they're, uh, they're cooperating. Brad Parscale, and I, I wish Brad Parscale all the best, uh, you know, it is he had a uh, basically what would be qualified as a mental breakdown. The police had to come out and prevent him from committing suicide. Very scary, very sad uh, situation. And he's reportedly under indictment, too. So there's a lot going on. That the New York Times just put out a story before uh, talking about 2016. So, it, you know, the, the Trump campaign currently has all the kids and their spouses and, and anyone in the family on the payroll. Brad Parscale had like a, a driver. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's so the theory is, is that Donald Trump, my theory is, is that Donald Trump unconscious uh, like i think he wants to win on a surface level but his subconscious knows that the, he just has to get out of this because it's not going well and he mm -hmm. he just does the craziest stuff it's like maybe he is this i'm trying i don't know why reinhold i try to give this guy the benefit of the doubt and try to give him some out because like he doesn't want to win because he just does the opposite of everything that makes sense right you know from the debate trampling over a, a clear ab ability to win and then he had two debates to make up for that he could have had two debates where biden comes out and looks very weak and then he cancels it he says i don't want to do it i'm i'm not going to follow those i don't want it. we could do it in person dude you have covid well, <laughs> well the thing is is too is everybody assumes that he's this great political genius and i don't see the proof of it i mean yeah. everything i've seen shows him to be just flailing around and and incapable of really understanding what's going on around him politically mm -hmm. um he's got people who have helped him along and done things for him but i think he stumbled into all of this yeah i don't really think yeah. he uh, had this great master plan or 5d chess and all the other stuff he's just winging he's, it right yeah. Just winging it, just out there winging it. I think the belief that you think something else is going on is the the idea that no, nah, no one's this inept. This person is out there, and these because these are just conspiracy theories, and that part of your brain just try to like not wanting to believe in a conspiracy theory. Like, no, nah, this person's got to know what they're doing. This person has to want this. And, nope, nope, not at all. They don't want it. He, because you're right. I really feel that even if he does win, right? Even if he does win, he's not going to serve his full term. He's going to step down. If he does win, yeah, but that's not gonna happen. So I don't know about that. <laughs> so guy, Ben, step down. I I think so. We were talking a little bit about that before. I think if he loses, mm -hmm. the next three months are going to be. Um, you, you think twenty twenty was bad? You think the last four years have been bad? I think the next three months are going to be very explosive and crazy. What's what's going on? Not if he he's loses. Gonna try and he's going to try to take down as many people as he can. He's going to try and get Barr to uh, arrest a bunch of people on trumped up stuff. Uh, pardon the pun. And then I, I, I think at the very end, like two, three weeks before, I think he tries to step down so that he can get a pardon from Pence. Mm. Mm, maybe. I, I don't know. I think he, if he loses big, then... And a lot of the poll, I know, listen, the polls, the polls, the 2016, 2016, I think a lot of conservatives are making the fatal conceded mistake that Democrats made in 2016 in assuming the polls are going to go their way because they went their way in 2016. But I think it'd be foolish to assume that people who are professional pollsters are doing their job in the same way that they did in 2016. They got caught by not identifying that white rural Trump voter. Correct. And that that former Obama voter now flipped to a Trump voter. 
and they are actively searching out uh, missing people. And so we know that white women who have no college education are trending from Biden towards Trump right now. We know that because they're actively searching out for people that, that they're not finding in their polling. Their modeling has changed. And so this is a fundamentally different race because Donald Trump is not the outsider candidate taking on the swamp. Donald Trump is the president and he has responsibilities and we're in the middle of three crises and there's a new crisis every day. And I think there is Trump fatigue syndrome setting in. I think there are a lot of people who are on the right that aren't kind of articulating it saying, listen, we got three justices. Donald Trump had three, two mandates. Don't be Hillary Clinton and get us Supreme Court justices and replace and get us, you know, these Supreme Court uh, guys. So now you've got Coney Barrett. You've got three. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of Republicans that are just going to go. I'm tired of making the excuse for him every day. I'm, I'm exhausted by this. We've got the three. Let's move on. Because the, the reality is for all the panic over the far left, and we'll do a show on this in the future. I'm working on something, but. Carter, when he got elected, was a very weak president. And he was, you know, this is the mid-70s. You're coming out of the, the, the you know, the hippie generation is starting to, to get involved in politics. And, you know, think of all the pictures of Hil Hillary and Bill, you know, working for McGovern in 69. They're starting to run for governor in Arkansas, for instance. Carter was a very weak liberal president. And the left, he never really got a ton done because he was largely paralyzed by the fights over generational power. Biden's going to run. He's going to be a lame duck president day one. And then you're going to see generational fights for power. You're going to see the squad versus Kamala versus Warren versus Cory Booker versus, you know, the more conservative people like uh, Joe Manchin. They're not necessarily going to be able to get a lot through. And if they do, they're going to go too far because the thing about Democrats and the left is they always go too far and do too much and think that the public is further along than they are. The fundamental flaw of the media and the, the, the typical national Democrat is that they think the public is Twitter and the public is not Twitter. If you look at the 2018 midterm elections, if you look at the election, the selection of Joe Biden, your, your average Democrat, your, your suburban voter who's willing to vote Democrat, you know, the, the, the Fishers is a very Republican area. The 5th District here is a, look up Dan Burton. That, that's his district. He was the guy who got in trouble for calling Clinton the scumbag. Like, he was a safe Republican district. That's about to probably flip to a Democratic stronghold because of Donald Trump. And that's the suburban voter who is going to vote Democrat, but is kind of independent in the middle. And that only flips because of the way that Donald Trump behaves and people are tired of making excuses and they kind of want to punish the Republicans for constantly making excuses. But they're not AOC. And if you think that everybody's AOC, you know, that's why Joe Biden doesn't want to say he's not going to pack the courts. He said previously he's not going to pack the courts. He was on the judiciary. He was head of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, he's, he, he doesn't want to piss off liberal Twitter because that's the media, but that's why the media cares about this. If you say to a journalist, I'm not answering a question, you know what they do? They pick at that until you answer the question, but Biden doesn't want to risk losing all the suburban voters, uh, or, or all the, the liberal leftist coastal voters, mm -hmm. it, you know? And so he's got this delicate band dance. And so the, the whole idea of you need to be terrified of the liberal and every Democrat's Antifa is just nonsense. It's propaganda designed by a president who wants to maintain power so he doesn't go to jail. And you're, you're falling for it. Like, the, the, the Biden administration will be one of inaction. Now, to be fair, so will the Trump administration because all that stuff that you like about the Donald Trump presidency that everybody goes, this is the most libertarian president, all that stuff happened under Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell in the first two years when... Kelly and Mattis and all the adults were around. The last two years have gotten almost no policy. Only really ugly stuff has, has happened. And every second term is always full of the B-list C team. You know, you, you Bush is down to Andy Card at the, at the end of his administration as his chief of staff. Who's going to go work for this guy in a second term? Who would want that job? 
So anybody who thinks that you're going, and, and if you think that Donald Trump's going to enact libertarian policies, go look at our show notes for Donald Trump's record on what he's promising. It's some of the most big government BS you've ever seen. And not for nothing, but when the cards were down and the pandemic was setting in, what did Donald Trump do? Donald Trump, and you heard Mike Pence take credit for it in the debate, you know, when the, when, when the virus hit, we acted correctly and we shut down half of the economy. Donald Trump sent this postcard to everybody. President Trump's coronavirus guidelines for America. It, this got sent, uh, it doesn't have a date on it, but uh, March 16th, 2020, it does have a date on it. Uh, that gave cover for all the Republican governors to shut down there. The day after this press conference is when Eric Holcomb here in Indiana shut down Indiana because they could rightly say, well, the president did it. Now, oh, well, but they didn't enact any laws, but there's something called a command climate and, and humans fall for this all the time. It's the perception of power that the presidency has. And so if you set a tone, people don't really read, right? People don't really research. People don't really understand what's going on. They don't really pay attention. They just heard, oh, everything's shut down. I can't go. And I, I you know, like Whitmer in Michigan, they're fighting over her power. She really doesn't have the power. And here in Indiana, Holcomb said, well, you have to wear a mask. It's state mandated. There is zero law in Indiana that allows the governor to force you to wear a mask. He can't do it. It doesn't exist. That legal power doesn't exist, but people do it because of the command climate, the perceived authority. And so Donald Trump, if he didn't believe this, got bamboozled by people who are lower level than him. He's a weak-minded, feeble idiot for doing this. And then he pumped $12 trillion, 20% of all currency, was printed in 2020 under under President Trump. He has, in the eight years of Obama, Trump in four has doubled the amount of debt added by President Obama in eight years. When the and chips he's called to take over the F, the uh, the Fed, he wants right. to wants to actually be in direct control of the Federal Reserve. Right, and so there is. There is little argument for either one of these people to be elected president. Neither of them are really going to do anything. And if you're actively arguing for one of these two candidates, it's very unlibertarian because you're not paying attention to their policies. It's just for flat out. Donald Trump is not a better libertarian candidate than Joe Biden. Like it just it's you're you're making up things when the chips were down. This is what happened. And. I got a lot of shit for saying it the day of the vice presidential debate. And then Mike Pence in the VP debate said, we shut down half the economy. And I went, mm, right again. Can't argue with my flawless research. So, uh, you know, it's just really a crazy time to see all these people saying Donald Trump is, is a, 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 an effective guy. So, so, you know, in terms of his communication skills, like, the video, uh, so Donald Trump's the most effective communicator since Ronald Reagan, we're told. He could have won that debate. He could have had a huge victory. He, he chose not to do it. He, when he got coronavirus, he violated one of the most basic principles of storytelling. It's called the hero's journey. You know, the hero of our story faces a, uh, you know, hold on, let me read it to you. Uh, so the hero's journey... Joseph Campbell, a professor of mythology, defined it, and he writes, In narratology and comparative mythology, the hero's journey, or monument, is the common template of stories that involve a hero who goes on an adventure, is victorious in a decisive crisis, and comes home changed or transformed. And I think everybody, when we heard Trump got coronavirus, said, I hope he's okay, but I really want him to learn a lesson. I really want him to prove that he understands and empathizes with the 200,000 people that have died in their families. You know, because that's a 9-11 every three days happening in this country, and it's increasing this week. None of this is fake. It's all real. And Donald Trump has done everything wrong in terms of the pandemic. He didn't release his CDC to decentralize testing you know, he's he's undermined the correct libertarian argument for the pandemic has always been take the science seriously, persuade people to act correctly and do not use government force 
Because when you use government force, it backfires. You create resentment. You create backlash. And that's what we've seen happen. People now go, it's fake. I'm not going to wear a mask. There was another study this week that shows masks, that d masks do work. It's decreased spread by 25% in some of these studies. You know, and so instead of instead of actually modeling good behavior to persuade people to do things that will help end the pandemic, Donald Trump has done the exact opposite, and he has helped flame that backlash and resentment that's taken us to terrible places that has killed a lot of people. The correct libertarian argument is always government doesn't work. And it hasn't worked through the lockdowns. The lockdowns have not worked. In fact, government lockdowns have made everything decidedly worse because of this backlash and resentment. It's, it's forced people into deciding whether or not to do things that are in their interest and the community's interest versus feeling like they're siding with the government if they do. And so, you know, I think... Everything that Whitmer did in Michigan was totally wrong. She tried to lock up an entire state. Her instincts have been totally wrong. And then that backlash leads to the horrible, horrible plan to kidnap her and basically start a civil war in Michigan. Totally reject well, that. And I don't... And you're and talking about... Well, you talk about uh, command culture, too. When you, when you start saying liberate Michigan, it yeah. doesn't help. He's, he's the standby and stand back stuff, the liberate Michigan. It's all a task. He knows that he is on thin margins and he can't lose any of his coalition. Yeah. He can't lose any base. And so he can't say that white supremacy is bad because he can't say anything other than what he said. He has to stand on the balcony and whip off his mask in some authoritarian show like you know, there he has to do that stuff now because he can't lose those people because it's so close. But Donald Trump's instincts through the pandemic, through the economic crisis, through the riots, all of this has been totally opposite as to what works and what decent libertarians would argue. You know, if you're a libertarian arguing that kidnapping Governor Whitmer is the right thing to do, you're wrong. Go go look up the lib, lib the wicker eh, the Wikipedia entry for the libertarian pledge. The libertarian pledge is that I don't, I will not advocate violence to achieve social or political goals. Every libertarian party member takes that pledge. The reason that pledge was invented in 1971 is that people don't remember from 68 to like 72, 73, there were 10,000 bombings in the United States. If you think there's violent radical action taking place now, it doesn't even compare to what was happening in the 60s and 70s. And David Nolan, who founded the party, instituted the Libertarian Pledge as a way to differentiate the Libertarian Party from those fringe violent groups on both the left and the right that were active at that time. And, you know, when Timothy McVeigh said that he was a Libertarian, Steve Dasbach, who was chair at the time, who is now running Joe's campaign, said... You know, Timothy McVeigh is not a libertarian. He doesn't fall under the pledge. These guys in Michigan are trying to use violence to initiate social and political change. And I know that they, they think that because cops exist, they should have the right to kill them. That's not what libertarians believe. That's not a peaceful society. We're trying to work for a harmonious, peaceful society built on cooperation. And violence does nothing to change that. And so trying to make out a hero out of all these right-wing militia guys, I'm not with you. I'm not with you on that. Uh, it's the exact opposite of what, what I want to see in a society. I don't want to live in a world where we're just picking off politicians because we don't like them. You know, it's just not, that's not a functioning society. That's a very violent, awful place to live. And we shouldn't advocate for it because the tacit, when, when you are saying things like, I won't wear a mask because I love freedom, what other people here is i'm i don't care about you and if it weren't for the government i would do the wrong thing when you say i want to violently overthrow the government other people here that somalia thing is totally true they just want somalia and anarchy right like so we undermine our very credibility and arguments with with some of this stuff and we've just uh you know, I've tried to to make better arguments and I've taken nothing but shit for it. And uh, it really is mystifying because 
I think I've been totally right. Government force has backfired. The lockdowns haven't worked. The pandemic is real. And there are a lot of people that have lost their lives that feel a lot of resentment at the president and the people that went to the John Lewis funeral and mayors and governors that are going to eat in restaurants. And I couldn't go to my grandpa's funeral. My grandmother couldn't have a funeral. My best friend died and I couldn't be with them to hold their hand. But Donald Trump gets to ride around in a parade. Donald Trump gets to just go and infect the people that he works for. You know, everybody gets to go to the John Lewis funeral, but I couldn't have a funeral for my parents. That resentment is really building. And the more people that pass, and that's why Donald Trump's numbers with the elderly are rapidly sinking. So let me see if I can find the numbers because it, it was a crazy drop in terms of the elderly vote because they know more people who have died. They know people who th their lives have been overturned more than anybody else's because they go to the doctor more. They trust their doctor more. Uh, so, you know, it's it, it, in that older group, he's really shedding votes. So in 2016, Jonah Goldberg writes at the dispatch in 2016, Trump won seniors by seven points. The NBC Wall Street Journal poll from Sunday has him losing them by seven points or 27 points, excuse me. So Trump won seniors by seven points four years ago. He's losing them by 27 points now. The CNN poll from the other day has him losing seniors by a mere 21 points. Seniors make up the biggest block of voters. And it's because they're paying attention. Older people watch the Actually news. Florida. Yeah. yeah, so they, they see how he has treated the pandemic. You know, and he knows he's losing seniors big because of the video that we'll play in a moment. So, um, there is, yes, I see him. He's an idiot. Freaking Ryan, man. I'm, he, he's not an idiot. Love him. Uh, anyways, so, you know, I, I really look at all this stuff and I go, it's hard for, it has to be hard for Republicans because you've got a guy who is actively undermining his own campaign and he's doing dumb things that force you to constantly make excuses for him. And instead of actually calling him out on his behavior, they just continually blame the media. Well, there's there's ends on that whole the media is corrupt thing. Like, there is no doubt that there is a liberal bias. Watch the post coverage of the debate. Like, there was never anything other than Mike Pence was an idiot and Kamala Harris won. Like, everybody knows the media is liberal. But, like, it has been taken to, it's the, take one red pill, not the whole bottle. It's now been taken to a point where we're, we're using it to excuse every insane behavior, you know? And, guy, and so I just have been looking for any honest Republican on this stuff. And Guy Benson wrote, this is a poll from January, Gallup, 56% say they're better off than they were four years ago. And Trump leads Biden 49 to 46 on the I agree with him on issues metric. But Trump tumbles eight net points on the question of presidential qualities. That's the ball game right now. He is why he is trailing. Ben Shapiro has been making this same point this week, uh, that Donald Trump is the reason he is losing. And you're going to start seeing more of that because the rats are going to jump off the ship and they're going to blame him for his loss, rightly so. You know, because of things like this. I, wanna, I want to show you just some some clips now listen some of this stuff is uh is funny like i I, re I was thinking about the old bush compilations if you remember the bush compilations of uh like bush saying and doing funny things some of that some of that is this uh, and some of this you'll go oh why was that a controversy that sounds much better than I thought. And then some of it is just flat out insane. So I just put together like a compilation of the last like few days. Like most of this is from the last 24 hours. But I think the best way for you to judge Donald Trump is just to listen to him and hear what he has to say and then make up your own mind based on that. Hi, perhaps you recognize me. It's your favorite president. And I'm standing in front of the Oval Office at the White House, which is always an exciting place to be. I got back a day ago from Walter Reed Medical Center. I spent four days there and didn't have to. I could have stayed at the White House, but the doctor said, because you're president, let's do it. I said, fine, you tell me what to do and I'm gonna listen. These are great professionals. 
They've done a fantastic job. And by the way, not only at Walter Reed, all over the country, we have the greatest doctors in the world. We have the greatest nurses, the greatest first responders, law enforcement, by the way. Incredible. So, to my favorite people in the world, the seniors. I'm a senior. I know you don't know that. Nobody knows that. Hi, perhaps you recognize me. It's your favorite president. And I'm standing in front of the Oval Office at the White House which is always an exciting place to be. I got back a day ago from Walter Reed Medical Center. I spent four days there and didn't have to. I could have stayed at the White House, but the doctor said, because you're president, let's do it. I said, fine, you tell me what to do and I'm gonna listen. These are great professionals. They've done a fantastic job. And by the way, not only at Walter Reed, all over the country, we have the greatest doctors in the world. We have the greatest nurses, the greatest first responders, law enforcement, by the way. Incredible. So, to my favorite people in the world, the seniors. I'm a senior. I know you don't know that. Nobody knows that. Maybe you don't have to tell them, but I'm a senior. We are making tremendous progress with this horrible disease that was sent over by China. China will pay a big price for what they did to the world and to us. But we have medicines right now, and I call them a cure. I went into the hospital a week ago, I was very sick, and I took this medicine, and it was incredible. It was incredible. I, w I could have walked out the following day sooner. It was incredible the impact it had. We're taking care of our seniors. You're not vulnerable, but they like to say the vulnerable, but you're the least vulnerable. But for this one thing, you are vulnerable, and so am I. I think we'll do well in California. I mean, you know, in theory, you don't win California because everybody likes to vote three times. OK, if you want to know the truth, I don't know if you ever saw the list. No, we're going to get are, into that later in the oh, program. Oh, the yeah. whole thing is crazy. But the, the people, they want to vote. They vote numerous times, numerous times. Well, I'd like to come uh, back to the White House soon to do another interview, Mr. President. Well, we'll I'd love to come back to the White we'll House. I well, saw it up Hillary close Clinton and being personal. Indicted for terminating 33,000 emails that she got from Congress. Congress made a request to see him. Everybody else I know gets indicted when they don't give that. They don't give, she, she destroyed 33,000 emails. Forget about the fact that they were classified. Let's go. Maybe Mike Pompeo finally finds yeah. them, okay? NBC disaster where he went on a, this show with Lester Holt. It was like, it was meant for a child. It wasn't meant for a, a grown person. Uh, he gets up and he says, we're not fracking. We're not fracking. He was fracking for six months. He was fracking. He was raising his his very thin hand and he was fracking. And now all of a sudden he's not fracking. Well, tell the Pennsylvania people that you're going, you know, it, it's ridiculous. He said, he's not fracking. That's all he said. And then all of a sudden he goes to a fracking right. mode. And how about her? She committed her life to it. And all of a sudden, she's a fracker. She's a big fracker. They're going to stop fracking the minute they get into office. They're lying to everybody. They're lying about so many different things. But you have to confront yeah. people. You can't I do it. I want to talk to you about you. that. And, and the radical left controls Biden. Biden won't be president for two months, okay? He won't be president for two months. So, if Biden so ever what got do you in, mean? You mean he'll, he'll have be... to step down? Are you saying he's you think he'll have to capable. step down after two months? He's not mentally capable of being president. You know that. Everybody knows that. Everybody that knows him, he can't be president. And this monster that was on stage with uh, Mike Pence, who destroyed her last night, by the way, but this monster, uh, she says, no, no, there won't be fracking. There won't be this. There won't. Everything she said is a lie. In fact, they well, go she back wants to and they agree the to the manifesto. Take a look at the manifesto. Oh, and Iran knows that. And they've been put on notice. If you fuck around with us, if you do something bad to us, we are going to do things to you that have never been done before. Oh. One of them is radical left Democrats. And they're destroying those cities. And if I'm the only well, thing standing exactly. in the way... Because this country, this, th this country will go to hell. Your taxes will double and triple and quadruple. Your stock markets will crash. We'll have a depression, the likes of which we've never seen before. And I learned so much about coronavirus. And one thing that's for certain, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. You're going to beat it. We have the best medical equipment. We have the best medicines, all developed recently. And you're going to beat it. I went. I didn't feel so good. And two days ago, I could have left two days ago. Two days ago, I felt great, like better than I have in a long time. I said just recently, 
better than 20 years ago. Don't let it dominate. Don't let it take over your lives. Don't let that happen. We have the greatest country in the world. We're going back. We're going back to work. We're going to be out front. As your leader, I had to do that. I knew there's danger to it, but I had to do it. I stood out front. I led. Nobody that's a leader would not do what I did. And I know there's a risk, there's a danger, but that's okay. And now I'm better, and maybe I'm immune. I don't know. But don't let it dominate your lives. Get out there. Be careful. We have the best medicines in the world, and it all happened very shortly, and they're all getting approved, and the vaccines are coming momentarily. Thank you very much. And Walter Reed, what a group of people. Thank you very much. I just, I almost, there's a 10 minute version on our YouTube channel. If you want to see more, it's double that, but it's just from the last week. And I kind of wanted to put this under it. But I didn't because we're fair and balanced here. Uh, You know, it's, some of that is just funny, like unintentionally funny. Like they say you're vulnerable. You're not vulnerable, but for this one thing, you're vulnerable. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then other stuff is just unintentionally, like, it's in, it's just sad. Like, if you're one of those people who had a loved one pass out of that 210,000 Americans, like, you, what, your family member's a pussy for not dominating it well enough? Like, it just, the, my thing on that last clip is that Donald Trump, again, the great communicator, was trying to be empathetic. He was trying to be optimistic. He wasn't trying to be anything other than that in my mind, but he just has never done it and he doesn't understand how to do it. And it didn't come through that way. And it came across as insensitive and ham fisted. You know, I think what's happening now with his dropping poll numbers is that it's one thing to read a tell all book and hear about the erratic behavior. It's one thing to kind of like, oh, see on your Facebook feed, your one TDS friend ranting about the president. It's another thing to actually pay attention and start see it live on television. And I think that people right now are kind of going, Ugh, Reinhold, like, this is, these people, this is not good. <laughs> no, and the worst part, too, I mean, one, one of the things that was really interesting in that when he said, we have the medic- best medical, excuse me, we have the best medical care. No, you have the best medical care. A lot right. Of people are trying to figure out what's going on. But yeah, you're getting a drug that what 600 people have had 300, uh, 300. And, it, and it's and it's um, reportedly based off of stem cell research. And it's like, you guys, mm, it's, <laughs> they don't understand how they're looking to the normal American, I think, or just like, I, I can't do this stuff that I want to do. Like my dad had surgery yesterday and my mom can only visit him for an hour every day. That's it. And it's like, you know, we're having to do all this stuff and make these sacrifices and and deal with the reality of what's going on. And he's living in a fantasy world. Right. Covita doesn't have to do any of it. Right. Covita gets to take a parade because he dominated COVID. You know, it's right. it's it, the elites. It's, it's that a whole mentality of the elites uh, in a society which we're not supposed to have. This society is not supposed to have that layer of elites in its uh, periphery. Right? So why are we doing that? Why are we letting that happen? It's just like, we should be fighting against that and, and bringing people down so that everybody, you know, is kind of treated equally under the law and you don't have this situation anymore. Yeah. There, it, there are limits. The gravity has to set in at some point and True. he has done everything the wrong way and it's worked some somewhat, but I think there's like, if you're familiar with the, the myth of Icarus. So, Icarus's father, Daedalus, was this inventor in ancient Greece. He invented the, uh, the, the labyrinth. And he was imprisoned by King Minos because he was too good at his job, basically. So he invented a way to escape prison for him and his son. And it was to build wings out of wax and feathers. And they were ele- the, the myth is that they were the first people to ever fly. Now, before they, they set off, Daedalus says to his son, you got to stay close to me, stay in the middle. If you go too low, you're going to get the wings wet and it'll weigh them down. You'll fall into the and, and And if you go too high, it'll melt the wings. And so once Icarus is in the air, he's the first person to ever fly. And, and hubris takes over and he gets intoxicated with the power that he has. 
and he just goes higher and higher and higher till his wings melt and he trumbles to his death. And I think there's a little bit of that where he's the Icarus candidate. He's just got people around him that tell him he's doing great. Nobody's telling him to stop calling into these radio shows. Whereas Joe Biden, everybody's making fun of him for hiding out in the basement or not answering questions about packing and all this. What Joe Biden knows is that you don't have to answer every question and you don't have to be heard. You don't have to talk. You just have to not be the topic of conversation. Stay out of the news cycle. The person in the news cycle is the person that loses. This is how Trump won. In 2016, Kellyanne Conway and Bannon forced Donald Trump to shut up. He just talked in the debates. He didn't tweet. He didn't do anything other than the rallies. And he didn't do all this extra BS that he's doing now. And it served him well because Hillary's pneumonia, Hillary's emails. That was the story. That was the topic of conversation. And that reminded people how much they hated Hillary Clinton. And he's kind of becoming the new Hillary Clinton. He's, he's sort of corrupt. He will use the power of the presidency for whatever personal things he wants to use it for. He's unlikable. He's exhausting. And... He's the topic of conversation, and it's going to backfire on him. Definitely. I mean, and, I, and I've been trying to say this for a while. You know, it's not – there's nothing policy-related that's going on in this, this uh, election. You, you, Neither of them are no, doing There's no, like, one thing where you can say, well, if the economy goes a little bit better and then this happens a certain way, then maybe the numbers start to change. Mm -hmm. and that's not what's going on. If you look at the numbers – for the past year, year and a half, they're steady. You've had Biden about 10 points ahead of Trump for a year, even when yeah. he was just a suspected candidate, right? right? And that's why he won is because people thought, well, he's got the best chance to beat Trump. People just want Trump out of office. During the, the impeachment, like 60% 60, 60 of the country wanted him removed from office. And those people just didn't change their minds after that. You know, people are exhausted during the during the impeachment. They did. Uh, I forget who it was, but I was listening to a podcast and they did a uh, kind of, you know, where they did a they brought people in and, and questioned them and said, hey, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And to a person, they all just said, I'm tired. I'm tired of every day. There's something new that I have to see and do and talk to people about and deal with. And it's just like I just want it to go back to a normal of some sort. Mm -hmm. You know, a little bit of a calm. Give us a breath. Let us take a breath and relax for five minutes. And I think people are just exhausted. And that's that's what this whole election is about. Yeah. Harry? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, this election, you, you no one's really talking about, like, any, like, specific policy. No, well, we're trying to do this, trying to get this. Like, it's just a lot of it's air. Um, they're both air salesmen. And it's just more of a, I hate him, I hate them, and air. Just air, just freaking air. I'm. They're selling air. It is. This is what I describe it. It is this because there is no hardcore concrete policy that that someone wants to push through. And in 2016, Trump had um, that one boost with the uh, with trying to. You know, I'm gonna. You know, I'm gonna get Gorsuch. We're gonna get Gorsuch. I was like, okay, fine. You know, so I'll, not me person, but the public was like, yes. So we get him. We get that. Now he's got air. He's got nothing. <laughs> yeah. And, and you're and you're absolutely right. So many, um, like. There's so many different, like, if you go to, all right, so I actually found bullets to go shooting, which was, I was shocked I could get some. But uh, at the range, everyone was like, I don't know who I'm voting for because not like Trump's going to protect the Second Amendment. Right. <laughs> you know, so you just sit there like, well, vote libertarian or do something else, but do, good luck. Yeah, the the emperor has no, no clothes. Um, 